This is just some of the footage of the creation of those visuals in Oppenheimer. This, along with other masterful practical effects, is how Christopher Nolan made the film. Follow along in this video to discover the journey it took from the first script to the final print. Oppenheimer is based on the book American Prometheus, written by Martin Sherwin and Kai Burt. When writing the script, Nolan was infatuated with the idea that during the tests of the atomic bomb, there was a slight possibility that the atmosphere could ignite and destroy the world. A big challenge he faced was trying to open up the character of Oppenheimer and let the audience see the world through his eyes. The script was written in the first person, which helped the actors be submerged in the mind of Oppenheimer and may have been the first of its kind. After finishing the script, Chris called Killian to tell him, I'd like you to be my Oppenheimer. He was his first and only choice. Killian said he was very excited when he got the call, but also a little nervous because of how big the responsibility was. And then I realized, uh, oh, that's a huge responsibility. <laughs> to prepare for the role, he looked at archival footage of Oppenheimer speaking, but the problem was most of that footage was him giving speeches using his presentation voice. Because of this, there was more freedom to interpret how Oppenheimer would act in more candid situations. His subtle expressions and still body language made for an amazing performance playing the lead for the first time in a Nolan film. Nolan knew that Killian's performance had to be centered, but he also knew he needed a huge ensemble cast around him. By surrounding him with some of the greatest actors in the world, this would challenge and push his performance. Matt Damon, who plays General Groves, was actually retired from acting at the time, but when Nolan calls, you go. Damon wanted to add humor to the role to help break up the more serious tones of the story. Robert Downey Jr., who plays Louis Strauss, is basically the antagonist of the film and fell in love with the character. Emily Blunt, who plays Kitty Oppenheimer, said she was drawn to the idea of a woman who refused to conform to the feminine ideal of the time. Every character, even the ones I didn't mention, were significant in helping Killian raise his game. Nolan's approach has always been based on realism. Each department had a burden to capture everything in camera. IMAX 70mm is the highest quality image format in the world, and it's something only a few directors in the world can achieve due to its heavy price. Each frame can contain 18K resolution. The movie is split between black and white scenes and color scenes. To achieve this, Kodak had to create a new black and white film specifically for IMAX. Hundreds of hours of work was put in to create this. The cameras are huge and make a lot of noise which adds to the degree of difficulty for filming. More dialogue heavy scenes were filmed with the Panavision System 65 because of this noise. I had never shot with an IMAX camera. So they start rolling and I immediately am just like, is everything okay back there? Because that camera sounds broken. <laughs> Director of photography Hoyte Van Hoytema had to lift the roughly 50 pound cameras to do the handheld shots, which is just badass. IMAX is traditionally used to capture spectacle and landscapes, but Hoytema was motivated to use the human face itself as a landscape, and the level of detail that it captured is incomparable. It immerses the audience even further in Killian's performance. I mean, he is strong, the Dutchman. He's, <laughs> he's, he's like seriously strong. That thing is really heavy. It's really big and cumbersome, but he's got a great team around him. Like that whole camera department is, they're, they're just as good as it gets. A lot of the particle sequences could have been done with CGI, but Nolan wanted the realism of filming them with an actual camera. The first crew member who Nolan showed the script to was his VFX supervisor, Andrew Jackson. It's funny because people think that there were zero visual effects in this film, which isn't true. It's just there were no completely CGI shots. Scott Fisher was in charge of special effects, and the two worked very closely to create these visuals. They would do tests with magnets, sand, and water with specific lenses made for these sequences built by Panavision to be able to shoot underwater and close up. Andrew and Scott created a huge library of visuals that Chris was able to pull from in his edit. Most of the time on set, visual effects and special effects were bundled together. The VFX crew traveled along with the entire crew during filming, 
which is unusual for big studio movies as they usually rely on doing the effects after filming. In a Nolan film, everything you can do for real, you do. For example, the scene where Oppenheimer is viewing the world in the quantum dimension was all filmed for real in camera. Chris is almost in the bed with me with some fucking thing that's going and around in front of the camera for real. And, and people will look at that and they think, oh, that's, you know, done in post, but it's not. It's Chris like spinning this thing that you see and it's all for real. To create the visuals for the atomic bomb, they had to figure out a way to do a smaller explosion that was repeatable from multiple angles. They used 60 gallons of gasoline with explosives, aluminum powder, and black powder to create the visual. Nolan believed that an all-CG shot wouldn't feel personal enough to the audience, so they created many practical techniques to further immerse the audience, and the end result was magical. Production designer Ruth DeJong created beautiful sets, most notably the recreation of Los Alamos, the place where they actually built the gadget. No one wanted to honor the time period, but didn't want anything to distract the audience from the story. Present day Los Alamos has been modernized with a Starbucks and a shopping center. So the crew built their own Los Alamos set at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico, and it shares the same mountain range as the real place. The real thing is massive, so building a one-to-one -one set wouldn't really be feasible. Ruth and her team created a miniature model of the entire town, and Nolan and Hoytema were able to map out where they would put their camera, effectively eliminating any buildings that wouldn't be in the frame. They were able to play with perspective and only build the front of some buildings as opposed to the entire structure. Hoytema says when they left the location, he felt Ruth built the set perfectly. They used exactly what they needed and didn't need anything more. This looks like it's massive, but these two buildings, if we look back, they're only five feet wide. We tried to play with forced perspective and just some cheats to help us get scale. There were multiple times in the movie where they filmed in the actual locations. Oppenheimer's house, the lodge, the office in Princeton were all filmed at the real sites. The scenes with Oppenheimer's security hearings were filmed in a small set, which was meant to mimic the pressure Oppenheimer felt being in a tight room questioned about his life. Another notable set in the movie was the Oval Office. Actor Gary Oldman, who plays President Truman, was only available to shoot for one day. Five days before filming was set to start, the Oval Office set that they were originally planning to shoot in became unavailable. They had to recreate and build the entire Oval Office set in that time. ABC had a set that was packed up in storage, and they had to work quickly to set it back up. It was missing many details like moldings, walls had cracks in it, so they had to work entire days just to make it work in time. By the time they shot the scenes, it still smelled like wet paint, but it worked. I want to give a shout out to Ludwig Goransson for his incredible score that went perfectly along with the visuals of the film, Ellen Moronik for her costumes that populated the scenes and made you feel the 1940s and Louisa Abel for her amazing work with the hair and makeup on this movie. Filming with IMAX made her job even more difficult due to the level of detail it captures with hiding the makeup on screen. Nolan said he's extremely grateful for his crew. Everyone worked tirelessly to make this film, bringing their best work every day, and his crew members said they were glad to do it for someone like Nolan because of how good he is at what he does and how good the end product was. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments if you'd like more like it, and please consider subscribing if you enjoyed.